Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Walter, and in today's episode, I'm pleased to welcome Silvana Di Sabatino as my guest. Silvana is a professor of atmospheric physics at the University of Bologna and coordinator of the Operandum project. She'll tell us much more about that in just a minute. How do you fix a river's embankment in Italy, control a landslide in Austria, mitigate desertification in China or control flooding in Finland without pouring concrete or using tons of steel? Well, in a nutshell, by leveraging nature-based solutions. Everyone agrees on the welcome side effects of those blue-green approaches. Yet, there's a critical step right before that we will explore in depth today and it's dead simple. Does it work? Actually, Silvana will reveal the scientific approach she follows with an operandum to answer that simple question and share several examples to make it very real for all of us. We'll discover the concept of opener laboratories and discuss how she integrates the sociologic part of the transition towards nature-based solutions. If you're a regular listener of this podcast, first, thanks, and then you'll recognize this episode as the closing part of our Blue Green Solutions trilogy. If you haven't listened to the other parts yet, I'll share you the links in the show notes to get to know James Murray and Marc Barra, our guides in parts one and two. I'll have the pleasure to host James, Mark and Silvana in a dedicated session of the United Nations Innovate for Cities conference. If you're curious, you'll find all those information in the show notes as well. Finally, if you're new to this podcast, consider subscribing. And if you like what you hear, please help me to spread the word and share that episode with a couple of colleagues or friends. I'll see you on the other side. You're listening to Don't Waste Water, the podcast that helps water professionals to improve their wastewater treatment, optimize their operation costs, and keep up with the latest market trends. This podcast is brought to you by GF Piping Systems. As a leading supplier of piping systems made of plastics and metal, GF Piping Systems is the global expert for the safe and reliable transportation of water, chemicals, and gas. For more information, visit gfps.com. Hi, Silvana. Welcome to the show. Hello, Antoine. Thank you. I'm very, very happy because we have a fascinating topic on the plate for today. But just before that fascinating topic, before our chit-chat, before hitting the record button, you mentioned an even more or similarly trendy and fascinating topic, which is the Nobel Prize. And I think... You have some elements here and some Italian pride to share about the Nobel Prize. Yeah, these are very important days because finally the Nobel Prize for physics went to three people that have done important contribution to the earth of climate and complex systems, especially the one on complex systems went to an Italian physicist. So I'm particularly proud to see how physics can contribute uh, to society and uh, the fact that uh, uh, climate is addressed also uh, within this discipline explicitly is an important step. To give everyone a bit of background here, you're also an Italian physicist. You're a professor at the University of Bologna. Yes. So can you tell us a bit what you're doing at the University of Bologna? Yes. Actually, I'm a um, full professor in atmospheric physics at the University of Bologna at the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And uh, I'm uh, one of the few female, actually, in this field and uh, in this role in Italy. Fortunately or unfortunately, let's say professors uh, uh, at the university in Italy are uh, very few uh, in this topic. And uh, This is uh, because the importance uh, of the contribution of physics to the society has been uh, not tackled probably with the necessity or with the care that uh, this discipline uh, merited. And how did you get interested into atmospheric physics? Uh, well, this is a, an interesting question. I was uh, studying physics, so I started uh, in uh, 1987, And it was my third year, and everyone around me were talking about uh, other aspects of physics, uh, like, say, physics of matter or high energy physics. And uh, those disciplines didn't satisfy me. 
And I thought uh, that I wanted to study physics because I wanted to study nature. Physics comes from Greek, that uh, means uh, nature. And also I wanted to study the way we uh, could change the way of thinking. And I wanted to do in a formal way. And looking around, I thought that I wanted to contribute to society. And I thought that atmosphere is the place where we live. And that will be where I will direct my studies. There's something which just um, pushed my curiosity when I was reading the Operandum website. And we, we will talk about Operandum in a, in a second. But in your portrait there on, on the website, there was this mention that you try to bridge fundamental science with applied science. And I thought, that's really interesting. So, so what are you doing there? Well, uh, Operandum, we will talk in, in a bit, is a, a large European project that have attracted more than 12 million uh, euros, including 26 partners uh, in Europe and uh, in China and Australia, where we use uh, demonstration sites that we will call uh, opener laboratories. I will come back to this in a moment. And the idea is uh, that to really construct the efficiency or the proof of the efficacy of natural-based solutions to mitigate hydrometeorological risks. What it means that differently from the usage of natural-based solutions in urban area, where often there isn't this requirement of really being having an engineering type of role in the sense that we use uh, dams uh, to have reservoirs or uh, to block uh, or to control the river flow. Now we would like to really promote uh, a change of paradigm on how we do engineering using nature. So for doing that, you really need to verify that your solution is effective. Because if I'm somebody sitting at the bottom of a landslide, yeah, and there is a, a moving land in front of me, I really need to be sure that my solution works. So it's extremely challenging then that uh, when we use natural-based solutions in a rural context on non-urban, so let's say to protect the coastline, to protect from river flooding, just to mention some, we have to engineerize I don't know if it's the good work. And so to transform what nature teaches us into an engineering approach, but conscious of the interaction with the citizens and the stakeholders for promoting the acceptance through knowledge. So that's where the evidence that comes from, let's say, hard science, that is what is this type of mechanism that we use is uh, monitoring, is uh, so acquiring data, and uh, to also be able to put in a numerical model, okay? So to use the scientific method for this specific application. So in this way, we are not talking only of co-benefits, which is very important, but the central in our project and also in our sister projects that tackle the same problem, we are three projects working together to solve this, is to push science in order to prove or give some credibility of the methods that we propose. Sorry for the long answer. There's a lot to deconstruct in what you just explained, but let me just start by verifying if I get it right. So that means that if you look at nature-based solutions, quite often you hear about the welcome side effects, what it would bring on top of solving the problem itself. And that is, by the way, a topic we've addressed on that microphone a couple of times, one of them being with um, Michael Stanegalistofer when we were speaking about regreening the rivers. But if I get you right, that is the part where everybody agrees on there are welcome side effects. But the core of it is, does it one-to-one replace hard engineering. And that is what you're trying to prove. So do I understand that, that right? Uh, yes and no, uh, partially. 
when we talk about natural based solution we talk about uh, green blue or hybrid okay so green blue whatever is related to to vegetation or to water as a system together or hybrid when is integrated okay probably for the next years integration with the gray will be so to go towards hybrid could be the way forward but it is uh, important uh, that when we really replace the typical engineering we are really sure of the maintenance and also of that solution over time because if a specific solution uh, that is based on nature i will make some examples if you wish of the solutions we are testing and demonstrating in operandum they have to have the connotation of good health in so maintenance is really important and maintenance is more demanding than the typical engineering so a bridge or although they have to be maintained as well but nature specifically so there should be a close control of it i don't know if i, I answer your questions you fully answer my question and I think if we take some examples, we can illustrate that. If I get right what you said, you, you were mentioning this landslide a bit uh, before. And if I recall right, correct me if I'm wrong, you have one of your open air laboratory, which is in Austria, which is dealing with this landslide. Maybe you have more than one, but maybe I mentioned now the word open air laboratory. Before going to the example, can we maybe define what that is? Okay, I'm, I'm particularly proud of your question on Open Air Laboratory because that's been a brand for Operandum. Didn't exist or only existed in a very sparse in the literature. So we are particularly proud that we wanted to find a concept that built on the existing concept of living labs, but tailored for uh, the objective that our natural-based solution have to have against hydrometeorological risks. So it's, a, in a way, a revisitation of the living lab that you we all know in, in urban context. We were discussing with Mark Barra from Regreen about the urban living labs. So Exactly. So this is, in a way, an evolution or a new, let's say, site of the living lab, but really customized for hydrometeorological risks. So if we then recall what are the ingredients of a living lab is a, a place, it can be a virtual place or a physical space where there is a connection between the scientists working together also with people. Mm? So where the solution, maybe the numerical mm, simulation I wanted to make is co-designed together with uh, the people that have an interest for that solution. So let's say that I wanted to change the setting, um, so the environment, I want to build a park or I would uh, build a new cycling path it is very important that I consult and also hear how people wanted to have the space where they live. So this is uh, at the heart, uh, somehow, of the living lab. So in a way, technical solutions, but those that uh, have the technical solution work together with the people. Okay. So let's say, uh, take this for a moment uh, as a common feature. So then we translate in a rural context. And there, let's say, as I mentioned earlier, we needed to make a step forward. I wanted that solution, make people also safe, okay? And if I promote that solution, I'm 100% sure that they may work over time, okay? So how we build this is uh, that our uh, open air laboratory will have the natural-based solution, the specific solution that is problem-specific, is problem-specific, so there is no one general solution, but it's specific. And then 
around it there is uh, the consultation for with the stakeholders so the landowner or uh, those uh, business players that have an interest in there and try to understand how to modify the environment still protecting from you know from a flooding that can be very damaging or from a storm surge or a landslide as i mentioned so the connotation you need to have is those scientific elements that make the scientific evidence for a solution like that so you need to have the engineering practice but you still have to have continuous monitoring the monitoring has to be adequate for the solution. So you may use a satellite, but you may use drones, but you can use uh, uh, low cost sensors. You can use laser scans or other, uh, let's say the best technology you can have according to the budget you have. Okay. And then you have used this data for testing, validating your model. And so project also the effectiveness somehow or project how your uh, MBS will perform also in 50 years, considering that in our project we have a strong also connotation of scientists working at climate projection, customized for the specific areas where we have our open air laboratories. Talking of these uh, specific areas, if I'm right, you have 10 of them? Yes. Can we pick one of them and try to describe what you intend to prove at that place and, uh, and how you do that? Okay, I would like to pick Italy, not because I'm Italian, because uh, out of the 10, it's uh, one of the all that is multi-hazard. Our open air laboratories have been identified a priori, let's say, to tackle specific hazards. Okay, one could be heavy rain, it could be droughts, it could be as I said, the storm surge. So some extremes that will go into river flooding and so on. So the case of Italy, that is a, a diffuse, let's say, open air laboratory, in, in, because it's constituted by three sites, actually, will focus on river flooding, storm surge, salt intrusion. Okay. And so our solutions work together because the Po Valley, it's anyway a connected system. So starting from the Panaro River, that is one of the affluents of the Po River, we will have uh, flooding. And in there, we tested, we are testing the introduction of seagrass with the deep root within the existing embankment. Okay, so this is uh, a solution that is a hybrid. So the typical, as I said, way of making the embankment safe is uh, by putting concrete or other typical gray solutions. So we are testing on part of the river this type of solution. But our stellar, let's say, MBS is the construction of a sand dune using uh, the sand that has been uh, put on the coast by previous storms. And this, for this uh, topology of uh, dune, there are a few examples in the world. One exists in Tuscany, but uh, has been rarely tested. So it's an advancement in technology, and we will go after to the market exploitation around these things. We have a patent already filed, European patent, where we constructed this dune also with the sensors and the vegetation. What is the role of the dune is uh, to in a way, dissipate the energy that comes from waves, from storm and from, from waves, and in, in somehow not only protect the intrusion of water more inland, but also somehow diminish the stress on the coast. So on, will have an effect also on the coastline. At that side, uh, because uh, this specific solution is also embedded on a system of monitoring and modeling. So at the same time, we have forecast, or let's say better projections of climate, of the currents in that area, let's say ocean currents or sea currents in this way, because it's the Adriatic Sea. And uh, at the same time, we are working through numerical simulation to understand if 
also introducing Poseidonia, you know, type of vegetation at the benthic level, could also work in a synergy with the dune. So in a way, we uh, sometimes there is non, not always one solution, but many solutions. So I only talked about the technology. This is probably understandable. But also in our context of all, we have a series of stakeholders and also contact with uh, uh, the citizens that live in the area at various level and try to also understand what is the potential for replication. Because one of the challenge of project of all projects, European project, is that you have one case, okay, a small case. Our journey is 100 meters, 200 meters. But this is not the solution if we have a coastline like Italy, where you have a coastal erosion or you potentially have storm surge, as in other countries. So the idea is to have a mechanism for uh, enough data to replicate and upscale our solution in other countries with the similar problems. Again, a lot to unpack in, in, in what you just said. Let me go back to the first example you shared around this, this grass, which is now holding the banks instead of the concrete or the gray approach we would have. And I'm a second generation hydraulic engineer, so uh, I was trained to uh, <laughs> to build that concrete and those rocks and that's the way you hold a river and don't get me wrong I'm firmly convinced that you can do differently I'm just wondering if if I'm the neighbor one of these stakeholders that you mentioned earlier I'm the neighbor of the river at that very specific point and someone comes and say I'm going to make an experiment with grass <laughs> instead of concrete how do they react yeah um, this is uh, then uh, how past experience also Libby Labs and also the co-creation and the social acceptance uh, or techniques for uh, uh, acquiring consensus or really do participatory science uh, is important. The key is, uh, first of all, to engage with those interested parties uh, since the beginning and really identify the best solution together. This doesn't mean that the typical engineer, sorry, but let's just to, to be precise, the typical engineer that works with us, and we have a typical engineering. We have, for instance, uh, uh, Rina Consulting, that is a large enterprise, that is one of the largest uh, engineering company in Italy, and they are part of the project. So the idea is... Uh, if we have a tested solution in a, the similar way that a trained, a typical trained engineer will do its solution, how can we transfer what we have new into the typical approach of identifying the problem, testing, drawing, uh, uh, let's say, the graphs, uh, make uh, the simulation, make uh, also all uh, the calculations that are not only of balances of forces, but also cost analysis and so on. So to take that, I'm not a civil engineer, but there is, let's say, a step approach for going to the implementation. So we wanted to customize what we have learned and what we have verified in that procedure so that we can facilitate also the transition on engineers that were, be, were trained in uh, on gray solutions could uh, over time also pick up new ideas uh, to embed uh, in their uh, gray solution. Let's say, let's add one component. So that's why I said probably hybrid uh, could be for uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, on short term, the, the best approach. I think there's also something very important in what you just said, which is that it's not hippie science. Like uh, you hear nature-based solutions and you think, okay, nature is going to do the job. It's not that straightforward. It's still ecological engineering. There's a lot of research of science behind and this modeling that you, you mentioned. Is that something you need to explain to people that it's not just, oh, nature will deal for it, but that there is science which is supporting everything? Yeah, I can add one, one element uh, that I missed. 
In Operando, we have a good portion of the consortium that is scientific-based and on hard science, let's say, and uh, technological players. So then the way of building that evidence, scientific evidence, is also done in the laboratory. So we have two types of traditional laboratories. So those that you use if you were an hydraulic engineer. So let's say that before testing that grass of, I talked earlier in the field, we test it in a water channel, okay? And we do computational fluid dynamics to really optimize how deep should be that root, how sparse it has to be, and also other, let's say, check on forces and so on. But it's not finished. It's not only in controlled, uh, controlled experiment as it is done in fluid mechanics or surrounding uh, topics, but also we have a customized laboratory it's a semi-controlled that is open air. So one of our partners that is actually a firm, Naturalea, in Spain, they have a network of channels where they can test also different plants because they talked also of uh, salt intrusion or uh, other type of solutions. And they can check through in their open laboratory, although it's uh, the equivalent of, uh, let's say, a controlled experiment, uh, but it's uh, open air. So the data that comes from the monitoring that occur in the laboratory will be integrated to build uh, also the, that evidence, uh, scientific evidence I was talking about. You mentioned at the very beginning that the maintenance part is something which is crucial because there is a strong difference in approach between a nature-based solution that may need a bit more maintenance than a gray solution. How do you measure and evaluate that? Because if you have to look for a 50-year lifetime of your solution, does that mean you have to make a 50-year experiment or can you speed a bit up the, the, the time where you're looking at that maintenance part? Well, this is not an easy question, and uh, to be honest, we don't, we don't have uh, the answer. We are working on that. So, what? But what I can say is, uh, of course, it depends on the specific solution you are looking at. Okay, so if you are looking at a dune, is a different that if you are looking uh, at uh, grass uh, or uh, or uh, trees uh, put on uh, on a slope. Okay, so. Again, this is uh, different according to the type of solution. And um, the maintenance is uh, through monitoring. So let's say that you could check, if you're talking about the trees, of, uh, you can check the status of, of the foliage, you can stay the, the, uh, also of, of the roots. If you, you have a dune, you can check, of course, as I said, that specific dune has also embedded the sensors. So that also control the shape. So one can control that the shape is uh, maintained well uh, within a certain range, let's say, of tolerability that has been designed in the engineering phase of that solution. And... Um, so that's uh, that's uh, the uh, the only thing I can say is that maintenance can be only checked through continuous monitoring. Okay, so it has to be part of the solution, probably differently from the gray solution. So let's say that me me anticipating your uh, question, it uh, may seem more onerous, more difficult, and say, okay, oh, this solution will cost me lots of money, but because one of the ambition is also to generate business and market, okay? So around those, there are many, many elements that can put, put on the market. One is to build or have acquiring the experience on using nature in our great solutions. And this is one, to use our patents, but also to work and really put in a technical terms the maintenance required because for now we don't have that experience 
And we know that uh, we need to go out of academia to be really convincing. So how can a professor that teaches atmospheric physics have the solution? No, we are working together with a team and we are trying to really hear from the various components uh, what is uh, uh, sensible, uh, what is uh, optimal also to do. So it's, uh, I think, uh, that maintenance aspect is something that can be exploited uh, at market level. I think that that is the key. That is really the key because I'm not sure it sounds more expensive. To me, it sounds more like differently expensive. When you're building a hard engineering solution, you have a high investment cost and then much less maintenance cost. So it's a high capex, lower opex. When you're building a nature-based solution, my understanding is that the, the capex is going to be quite lower, and then you have an OPEX. So you're basically turning an environmental service into a business service. So it makes kind of a lot of sense. Yeah. And also, you mentioned, thank you really for uh, helping me in this identifying. Uh, there's so much to say. Yeah, we shouldn't forget then what NBS were sought for. So the benefits, the co-benefits associated. So once we are really sure on the terms we talked about earlier, uh, that that solution is effective, then there are other benefits that we could uh, contribute to in um, to have a better ecosystem to the maintenance or to the enrichment of the ecosystems and also it's also uh, an opportunity for uh, regaining that contact with the nature that uh, it's uh, at the basis uh, of the spread of this type of solutions as i said without that specific connotation of being engineering, let's say, directed. That is an extreme challenge. So it's a very difficult product. Uh, but, but let's say rewarding because it goes in the direction I was mentioned, mentioning that uh, to do something useful for society, at least for my contribution, from, at least from the scientific point of view. You were hinting at the business consequences of what you were doing with the example of the sand dune where you are patenting what you're doing. And that may then result in something which shall become commercial. Is that part of operandum? Like it's foreseen that you will spin off into yeah. some yeah. companies? Operandum uh, is an in, uh, innovation action. Yeah. So it has uh, in its uh, objectives also to contribute to European leaderships around uh, those topics and also market enhancement. So, of course, these are loose terms if you don't specific what means market enhancement. So let's uh, be modest or uh, not uh, uh, too large in our vision. And uh, we start to say that in our consortium, there are few firms. I, I, I mentioned Rina Consulting, but I mentioned Naturalea yeah, in Spain. But... Uh, also, we have uh, Kayo services in Slovak that uh, work on the development of our digital platform that I didn't mention, the GeoIKP, that is also one of our, let's say, stellar output uh, of the project where we will integrate science and technology and uh, social aspects of uh, our results. And then also we have KKT ITC in uh, Greece, and uh, what they have re- we have a PNO also uh, in Holland that uh, do uh, communication and communication. But let's talk of those business firms that are engineering devoted somehow or uh, informatics as Caio. Uh, First of all, the Rina Consulting have improved internally their knowledge about putting solutions, gray solutions on the field with, with the natural based solutions. They have already increased their portfolio. Naturalea has increased uh, already of 20% their business because they now are those experts in the country, but also outside of that specific solution. Greece is uh, one of the example of OL 
at early stage, there were no natural-based solutions talking in Greece. And that company has been already in contact with the ministry, Greek ministry, and now is uh, uh, having contact with other firms in the country to replicate uh, the solution they have for their river flooding and uh, also to help with different aspects of modeling, but also the categorization of stakeholders and so on. So it's a starting small, but if you have this replicated, that example replicated, it's a, a good example of business because if you're a firm, you can collaborate with the other companies, each part that tackles the chain of the MBS verification and implementation. So it becomes a business model. Beyond the business model, you mentioned GeoIKP, which is your, your web platform where we can see the various initiatives and the various projects. You mentioned also that you have these social scientists working with you to have this kind of connection, I guess, to, to the, the, the general population. How important is communication for you and in the success of Operandum? Uh, it's a key. And uh, as a physicist, uh, when I started uh, doing this, uh, let's say, to do also the work I do, the science I do, in this way, it has, it has been a shock. I started uh, back in uh, 2016 with my first project uh, in where that, that had uh, co-creation, also so consultation with the citizens, teaching them how to use uh, a sensor for uh, monitoring air quality, uh, making sense also of the data they were using and so on. So since then, so I can say uh, around now uh, five, six years already, I have really communication and uh, is uh, uh, the first thing I do before starting a project or a, a new, let's say, a scientific effort. Uh, I have uh, the way uh, the commission uh, through uh, Horizon has pushed also the scientists in really be uh, out of their office uh, and really be integrated uh, with uh, uh, citizens and stakeholders is a uh, really the key and has, has changed my way of thinking. But going back to your question, communication is fundamental in uh, whatever we do. So as a coordinator of Operandum, when I talk to individual partners, I always uh, ask what is the impact of what you do? And to generate the impact of what you do, it means uh, who have you been in contact with? Besides your uh, typical scientific conference, uh, have you spoken to the mayor of that uh, uh, city? Have you talked with that ministry? Have you talked also with uh, the citizens? Even in uh, small terms, but uh, ask to any of the scientists and partners, what do you do? So if you only do the work for yourself and you don't share and communicate, it can be on your bookshelves and it doesn't really change the world. It doesn't impact anything. So let's say a communication for me has been translated in how you generate an impact. What is also the indicator you use to see that what you have generated have changed something. Even a small thing, even a, a small aspect. If somebody writes to me an email and saying, uh, having heard that seminar, have I have learned and now I use this concept in my research, or rather the partners I mentioned, the, the engineers from RENA Consulting say, I was trained as a typical engineer and now I have a new knowledge in front of me to use it and to put in the context of what I know. Or if I'm a citizen and I know that I can also make use 
of the environment on my territory in a different way. This is uh, a measure. It's an indicator of how we measure if that communication has been impactful. You mentioned an example where probably your communication has worked quite well because you said that there were no nature-based solutions in Greece and that now they're looking at trying to implement them. So if I was to look at the other end of the spectrum, uh, Greece being new to the game, what would be a typical country which is already very advanced in nature-based solutions? Thank you for the question. Again, another element of a parandum has been uh, learning from experience. It is true that being in Europe, we are conscious that the cultural setting, the economic setting is rather diverse. Even our perception of nature and how we treat our territories. And as it is true that uh, Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, or, you know, even Germany or Belgium have a different perception of nature. If we stay with the Scandinavian, it is true. They have nature around them. We have people and concrete around us. So in Southern Europe, they say that contact with the nature is really not so diffuse because what our common experience is cement, it's buildings. If we look at the Povale, but are examples in Italy, but in other countries that are re- really crowded, you know, even uh, in Greece, but in Greece there are other, other aspects. But anyway, so uh, in our project, we have examples from countries that uh, are in Finland, like Finland and Germany. So we have uh, an oil in uh, in Finland looking at uh, around the Purovesi Lake. And they then their problem is uh, how maintain purity of water. So com- different problem, let's say, of what I mentioned, purity of water in case of extreme rain. Okay. So then we learn that if you want to maintain already a system of natural base that collect water in a, in an efficient way, uh, that water is used for irrigation, uh, etc., for agriculture or other aspects, you then shift the problem to the effective management. So what we learn from OIL Finland and OIL say Germany, that is uh, on a part of Elbe River. In there, they have the problem of excessive rain. So how you could maintain that territory in such a way that you don't provoke extra damage because of heavy rain. So the key in both all is the management. So let's say those examples where you have already a solution, let's say, embedded in that system, is uh, functional to learn. What do you learn? You don't only learn the management part, but also you learn the collaboration and the communication with the stakeholder. So what have they done for making that solution still working? What people, how integrate citizens in the maintenance also of uh, uh, of their natural-based solutions. So this is what we learned from them. To round off this deep dive, let me let me close with a last question on Operandum, which is your timeline. What, what do you expect to deliver by when? And what will tell you in maybe five or 10 years that you've succeeded in what you did? Okay, uh, we are uh, more, uh, let's say, a bit more than one year to the end and completion of the project. What I wanted to, to achieve in this uh, one year is uh, integrate the knowledge we have produced. So we have already started in the integration and as I mentioned, the JRKP is uh, our tool to do that. So at the end of the project, we will work in the maintenance of Uh, continuing this uh, platform will not end with the end of the project. We have already funds. We are working at the University of Bologna and the company that is Cayo Service for having, uh, attracting uh, uh, new funds for uh, the promotion of this platform that is a unique platform because it doesn't replicate the existing ones because it has been sought with MBS 
for hydrometeorological risks at the beginning. With that rationale, we have talked about. So the JRKP now works also at the cost benefits. It will be a marketplace where you can find uh, partners, you can find also investors, because investors, policymakers, we didn't talk about policymakers, but the idea is also to attract the attention of those local authorities that could change some of the regulation in order to facilitate the introduction of a natural-based solution, the typical uh, solutions for the maintenance of the territory, and to maintain and to go towards uh, the resilience. So the JRKP will be also a place where, for every solution, we look also at the these benefits, of, we talked about co-benefits, but also negative benefits in order to really facilitate the spread of transparent knowledge and also to acquire true knowledge or uh, true information, uh, a better um, understanding of the type of solutions that they want to implement. I said it was the last question, so... I'll cheat and I make another last question because you just remind me of that that aspect of the regulation. Is that another way to look at how you could say you succeeded with the project if in five or 10 years there's a European regulation that brings NBS like really in the stone or a local regulation and you also have labs in China or, or in Australia, if, if, if I'm right. So is regulation part of your your roadmap yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, because of that process of engineerization, it's a uh, neo neologism, so maybe it doesn't exist, but uh, working with the nature for uh, engineering purposes, let's say, you need to tackle that. You need to understand what are, I cannot introduce solutions everywhere. So, I really need to have an understanding of what are the concrete problems. So despite it's, it's a project, but we wanted to have the challenge of really implementing the solution. So the regulation, learning the regulation is a part of the process that we have anyway undertaken for really implementing the solution I talked about. There are few solutions, but we did all the steps just to verify. At the same time, we inform and also we engage those regulatory bodies in our process so that they, through the acceptance that has been generated by also including citizens and others, also facilitate the process of pushing the introduction of MBS in the regulation. So, of course, a typical, not typical, maybe the key KPI would be to see how many rules, uh, regulation processes have you changed and in many countries. How many countries have you really made that change? Very clear. I think that makes for a, a good closing to that deep dive. Of course, I'll put all the links to, to the, the Operandum website and the IKP platform in the show notes. But if you're still ready to take on, um, <laughs> let's close with the rapid fire questions. Yeah. Okay. It's time for the rapid fire questions. In that last section, I'm asking you short questions and uh, you shall aim for short answers. But don't worry, I'm not cutting the microphone in case you need a bit more time to explain. My first question would be, what is the most exciting project you've been working on and why? Well, this one, of course, Operandum has been the most exciting, probably because of the many for the interdisciplinarity that not always in my past project I had at this wide spectrum of experts to work with. What's your favorite part of your current job? To see that good work has been done, to see a publication being used, to see uh, a solution being adopted, and uh, to work with uh, satisfaction and to see people really happy to do 
their simulation because they are contributing for a small part to that change and that improvement that we need in our society. So working maybe with my researchers and also to see the good work done uh, with honesty, intellectual honesty, transparency. This is the most important thing. What is the trend to watch out for in the water industry? <laughs> This is a difficult question. Uh, I think is uh, the trend is that uh, we need integrated uh, knowledge. So to build around that topic more experts. This is not the job of only one. So to really form uh, managers that are able to identify uh, those experts that contribute to that area. Because uh, when one talks about water, thinks of hydrologists, but uh, I think uh, that uh, the problem is more complex. What is the one thing we are doing in water management today that will be looked at totally stupid in 10 years? Uh, maybe to do uh, manual monitoring. So in the future, uh, everything will be optimized uh, uh, with uh, uh, sensors and everything will be also made more, uh, let's say, digital. Uh, one of the problems in many countries is that we don't have access to data. And uh, let's say all uh, information has not been uh, digitalized. And uh, this is uh, true in uh, many places in Italy, in Southern Europe, in Greece and so on. And this will be stupid to say, why don't you have your data on your computer? That's a very, very, very interesting point. And we, we, were, we were discussing that in depth with David Lloyd Owen on that, on that microphone, because he was showing how for many countries, you simply don't have data on water. And most of the time, not in the country you would expect. Like in Europe, you don't find that much data when you would expect them to be good yeah, pupils. Yeah, we don't have a sensing, a proper sensing, if you want to use, you know, trendy word of our territory. And that will be in in the in 50 years uh, probably this is unimaginable that we really use uh, this way of having contact with uh, our territory that is so based uh, on the decision of a single and also mistake of a single. You know. How do you keep up with the trends, with the scientific news? What are your sources? Well. Uh, let's say I'm a scientist of the role. So what I do is, uh, of course, I try to keep at the front of my specific core business. So as an atmospheric physics, physicist, I also look at the interaction between the surface and the atmosphere. So what is called micrometrology or boundary layer physics and also mesoscale dynamics. So my first, let's say, duty is uh, to keep at the front and be able to really be at the top in, in my specific field. For the rest, I try to watch newspaper or uh, YouTube's uh, podcasts and, uh, and also participate to uh, conferences that are more general and uh, be in contact also with uh, the municipality or uh, also ministry and uh, so that uh, I try to understand what are the needs. So from what part to try to be at the front of what I'm able to do in my specific field at the same time uh, to keep a good contact with what is going on in the society. I don't know if it's a good answer, but it's the best answer I could give. I think it's a very good one. I have a Last question. Would you have a fantastic speaker that you could recommend me that I should definitely invite on that same microphone? Well, as I said, the Ministry of Every Country looking at uh, ecological transition, I think those uh, that uh, may really be able to implement the good science we have in reality and in the context of where we live. Perfect. Well, Silvana, it's been a pleasure to discuss with you. For the one that would listen to the podcast first and then to the conference, I'll have the pleasure to have you in our common 
conference at the Innovate for Cities conference um, on the 13th of, of October. And for the one that do it in the reverse order, make sure that you also listen to my interviews with Marc Barra and with James Murray if you want to go really at the, at the bottom of nature-based solutions. And again, thanks a lot, Silvana, and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.